everyone. I'm John Evans, and welcome to another episode of One on One. Gerard Mustaf spent his earliest years growing up in Whiteville, North Carolina. His basketball talents grew, and he grew physically after his family moved to Maryland, where he ultimately ended up attending one of the top basketball high schools in the country. An all-ACC career followed at the University of Maryland, and then it was off to the pros, where he played against the best in the world, first in the NBA, and then in international leagues, where he won two championships. Since then, as executive director and CEO of the Take Charge program, Gerard Mustaf has developed services that combine basketball and life skills to benefit challenged young men and women. And now, Gerard is coming back to southeastern North Carolina and offering one of those free programs to children right in his hometown area. Whiteville native, former NBA first round draft pick Gerard Mustaf is coming back to southeastern North Carolina. The former champ is bringing his free basketball camp to Thomas Academy, a public charter school for middle and high school students on the campus of the Boys and Girls Homes of North Carolina in Lake Waccamaw. And Gerard Mustaf joins us from his home in Maryland. Gerard, welcome to the One on One with John Evans podcast. Hey, John, thanks for having me on today. We appreciate you joining us. Your camp runs from June 13th through the 17th, and it's free, but this is more than basketball, correct? Yes, sir, it's more than that. So we wanna get life skills. So I've been doing basketball life skills for about 30 years and um, always felt that kids do better when you can bring life skills into the equation. Things like uh, cyberbullying, anti-bullying, um, leadership development, health and health and uh, nutrition, all these things I think, you know, add to the overall student athlete. So we wanna see what we can do to kind of, you know, that, to leverage that and to allow kids to grow, um, particularly in the summertime when they have a lot of idle time. Now, this is through your organization called Take Charge. You're the executive director, but this is the organization that your father founded, right? Yes, sir. My dad founded this about, what, 1990, so about 32 years ago. Um, my dad's vision was to, to, to bring an outlet to help young people, uh, really a second chance program for young people. And it kind of evolved over the years into uh, outlets for kids to do different things. And one of the things that we wanted to do is to incorporate sports into it. We found a lot of kids, um, if you can add sports to the equation, uh, a lot of kids sometimes um, have a chance to to really open up to you with sports. Um, a lot of times when you don't have sports, the kids close down, close up. So this really allows kids to really express themselves in a different format. And this has really been a, a blessing for our family uh, to build our legacy with just giving back to the community. And let's face it, when you've got a, a guy who's 6'10", who played in the NBA, they'll listen to pretty much a lot of what you're going to say, right? Right, that helps a lot. You know, so <laughs> I prepared for them. There are a lot of kids really like you to be um, around a former athlete. And so I use that to my advantage. I like to leverage it whenever I can. What do you remember, Gerard, about growing up in Whiteville? You were here for a time, and then the family moved away, I guess, to follow your father, who had moved up to Maryland. But what do you remember about growing up in Whiteville? Just the community, uh, family-oriented. Um, everybody is so nice in the South. You know, everybody's respectful. Um, they're a lot nicer than they are in the North. I will say that. <laughs> um, the food is great. Um, really community oriented. Um, but the one thing that we did not have was a lot of outlets for sports. Um, you know, we ju I just felt that the kids didn't have that. You didn't really experience former NBA players or, or professional athletes coming back to the community. And so I wanted to see if I could do something like that, you know, just to really to help broaden, you know, their perspective. You know, a lot of times you don't travel as much when you're in the South. And, um, if we could bring, you know, these outlets to the community, um, then that's an advantage. And so I just try to do those things. And, um, you know, it's, I think it really helps the community out a lot. Take me back though, to the time when you did move. If you liked growing up in one place, it's, it's, it's upsetting sometimes for kids when they have to pick up and move. Do you remember what that time was like when you actually did make the move out of Whiteville up to the North? 
Yeah, I will tell you this. So when I was in Whiteville, I always tell a story. We had about three channels. I think three, channel six, and I think 13. Um, when I first got to Maryland, uh, we had cable. Uh, and, and so to me, that was an outlet for me. We had cable. Um, down the street was a recreation center um, that I was that I could go to every single day. So those are two fond memories. And through basketball, I met other other kids my age. And so that helped alleviate some of the stress and strain about transferring, you know, you know, from state to state. Um, you know, so I always love to, you know, I always love and advocate for kids that they can get involved in sports because sports bridge the gap. Sports allow you to meet friends and it made my transition much easier for me. Uh, how old were you, number one? Well, I was 13. And um, was, the thir was that young teenager wanting to stay in Whiteville and say, Mom, I don't want to leave here? Well, I, I think that, see, the, the two summers prior, I spent both summers in Maryland. Um, and so I got my feet wet a little bit um, in those summers. And so I thought that, hey, this could be a good thing. And um, when I looked at opportunity to stay with my father, um, I looked at the resources that we had in Maryland far outweighed resources we had in Whiteville. All of those things made it a lot easier and more palatable for me to, to say, hey, I think I might want to step there for a little bit. Um, so I thought it was a great choice for me. You played at DeMatha Catholic High School in Maryland. Any Anyone who's from the Northeast, and I grew up in the Poconos in Pennsylvania, so I know mm -hmm. of DeMatha and the powerhouse that they had there. Uh, was that a goal of yours? to play at that school? How did you get involved with getting there? And then it just raised your level of uh, just notoriety as you began to, number one, grow a little bit more and then get better with basketball. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to the summer basketball camp. So my first introduction to a basketball camp um, and those summers prior to me moving was at Morgan Wooten basketball camp. And so I was had a chance to, to learn on his tutelage and uh, once I saw who he was and, and witnessed uh, his effect that he had on people, um, including myself, that it was a no-brainer. I said, man, I want to play basketball for this guy here. Um, and, you know, my parents decided that that was going to be the best option for me. And um, I was in agreement. So we, we made that, we made the move. When was your greatest jump in talent level, Gerard. I know from some of the research I did, you grew a great deal in high school, correct? I mean, in size wise, but right. what about your game? When did your game grow and all of a sudden make you a, a McDonald's All-American in 1988? Um, I would say two different years from seventh grade to eighth grade. I'm not sure what happened, but when I got off of the Trailways bus from Whiteville to Maryland, my game completely changed overnight. So I don't know what happened, but um, you know I could barely dunk one basketball or let me say a tennis ball at Central Middle School in Whiteville. Right. When I got off the bus the next day and went to the recreation center, I could jump and dunk with two hands in Maryland. Don't know how it happened, but it happened. So I would say from seventh grade to eighth grade was probably the one uh, jump. And then from ninth grade to 10th grade, uh, I was also able to make another leap in terms of uh, talent, skill, confidence, um, and put all those together. Um, you know, so those are probably the two years that I could stand out in my mind to allow me to really develop into a good player. And was that a lot of Coach Wooten's doing? Yeah, it was accumulation, accumulation over a couple of years. And so once you go to this camp, you work on fundamentals and it's, you know, it's repetitive. You know, you work every single day. And what I did do, um, I didn't take a day off. So, I mean, rain, sleet, snow, no matter what, I found a way to play basketball uh, from eighth grade through the 11th grade, not one day off. And so when you do something consistently um, and you have passion behind it, you really have no choice but to get better. And so, you know, I just leaned on those things and 
and pretty soon my talent level began to exceed my peers. And uh, it was very noticeable. I think people picked up on that. And I even saw it. And I said, wow, I actually can play a little bit better than my friends. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Uh, you know, I, I played basketball in high school. I think I was the sixth or seventh guy off the bench. But not being a McDonald's All-American to that caliber level, did you notice it coming easier? Or what was the mindset of a young 16 or a 17-year-old? You said you practiced all the time, but all of a sudden, did it click that you could do things that you couldn't do before? Or you could do things that the kids who were beating you in one-on-one -on -one couldn't beat you anymore? Yeah, I think that's part of it too. But I think that I also played with some very talented players who were better than me at the time. So I had a chance to play against, with a kid, a guy named Danny Ferry. Oh, um, yeah. Danny Ferry was a was a senior when I was a freshman. So every single day in practice, he would kick my butt. <laughs> and so the coach made me defend him every day, and I would never win. Um, so that once Danny graduated, I had a teammate of mine that said, hey, man, you just played against the best high school player in the country. Everybody else is not even close to him. So I just remember that. And so I think that gave me the confidence. And, you know, the second thing is um, Coach Wooten told me that, hey, Gerard, you can start lifting weights now. And he said, you can lift a little bit of weights, but that's going to give you confidence as well. And so I, I think that when you start lifting weights, you know, you see your body change a little bit, a little muscle here and there, um, particularly for, for guys. It makes you feel that you're probably a little better than what you were. And so you have the confidence to start doing things and trying things, um, you know, and obviously when you have a coach that's, that has some of the greatest players, you, you talk about the, the Adrian Dantley's Adrian branch and Wittenberg and Lowe and right. I mean, a ton of players that came through coach. Rubin. And so if he can help produce those type of players, then, Hey, I'm think I'm next. And so all of that combined, it gives you that confidence that you can pretty much do anything. Um, and, I, and, and pretty soon it all came together. Do you remember the first recruitment letter you got? Who was it from? Uh, uh, Bobby Crimmins was my first. Georgia yep. Tech. Yep, yep. Georgia Tech. Bobby Crimmins was the first guy. And I, and I met Bobby the summer of eighth grade uh, at basketball camp again. <laughs> the basketball camp. And he wanted to get in early. He saw me. He used me as a, as a demonstrator for him. And he was the first guy that gave me a letter, a wrote a letter to me. So, um, and he was one of my final three choices. That was probably my second choice of, of colleges. Yeah. Your uh, mother and your father developed a questionnaire for coaches who wanted Gerard to play for their program. That I think is fascinating because it really, it wasn't even necessarily centered on basketball. From what I've read, it was centered on life. It was centered on treating African Americans well on campus and in the program. It seemed to me to be more than just a basketball questionnaire, correct? Definitely. So, you know, my parents were very keen on um, off the court. So they wanted to, to develop a, a complete person, um, not just, and my dad said, not just a jock. Someone who was conscious about family, conscious about the community um, and just being an advocate for people in the community. What could we do? What could, how could we use the basketball platform or your God given talent to help people other than yourself? You know, just being selfish, just, just being a servant of people. And that was an opportunity. Once I arrived to a certain point of notoriety, um, you know, that was a, a vehicle that we could use uh, that could benefit not just myself, but a lot of other people. And, and if it didn't happen right away, we kind of plant the seeds in certain minds that people want to take it serious. Um, you know, so, and, and I'm, I'm friends with Tommy Amaker and, and Tommy Amaker has actually been recruiting my son a lot lately. Uh, and he was a great point guard at Duke when right. they were recruiting me. And at that particular point, um, Coach K didn't have any black assistant coaches. And so when he came to the house, my dad asked him, you know, are you going to hire somebody? And so, so 
anyway, him and Coach K had a, you know, they had a, 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 a spat, so to speak. And within about six months, uh, you know, uh, Tommy Amaker became one of his coaches on the, joined the staff. So we don't know if we were the impetus for that or not, or just that things just happened, but we just wanted to plant those seeds in minds. And so that people would consider, um, you know, high quality, qualified black assistant coaches. And um, we're just happy that it all worked out for them. So what was it about Bob Wade and Maryland? You said Bobby Cremens was in that final three. You ultimately chose Maryland and Bob Wade was the yeah. coach. He had just taken over, I guess, for Lefty Drizel after the tragedy of Lenny Bias's passing. Uh, yeah. What was it about going to Maryland, aside of the fact that you lived in that area yeah. and, and were uh, familiar with the campus, but what was it about Bob Wade that brought you in and wanted you to be a Maryland Terrapin? Um, I had a chance to really know Coach Wade intimately. Um, you know, I, in the 10th grade, we played Dunbar and beat his Dunbar team, his last team. Um, and then when he came to Maryland, you know, we just stayed in touch and obviously he was recruiting me. Um, I had a teammate, high school teammate who was also one of his players. Um, so I stayed on campus. I, I was at campus all the time. Um, just so happened to him and my dad were on the same age. So they clicked, um, spent time together. Um, it, it, it's a rapport that you get with certain people and, you know, with coach Wade, we, we developed that. Um, and because it was a, you know, it, it was down the street, probably two miles from my house. Right. Like I was at campus all the time. Um, they played in a tough ACC, which I grew up watching Jefferson Pallet, Holly Farns player the game, all that, <laughs> all the time. You remember that? So, yep. so I had a chance to watch all that. So I wanted the ACC. Um, and I looked at Derek Lewis, who was the player that was leaving, departing, that I was actually going to fit in and play his role. Um, you know, Coach Wade had talked about the basketball standpoint, what could it do? Um, and so my high school was actually a mile from College Park campus. My house was two miles. So it, it, everything kind of lined up. Um, at that time, John Slaughter was a chancellor at Maryland. Um, he was the first and only black chancellor at an ACC. Right. And he made a commitment to me that was going to allow me to do some things outside of basketball. Um, and it's more community oriented stuff. And so when I looked at the bigger picture, when you looked at the chance that your family, your friends could see you travel up and down, you know, 95 or, or just the East coast, um, and, you know, they were good to my family. And I just felt that Coach Wade would take care of me. If, you know, and so if something happened to my dad, I knew that I had a father figure in Coach Wade. I knew his players from, from Dunbar. I had recognized and read what he'd done, you know, for those guys and how he was he was a standing dad for them. Um, and it just made sense for us. It just, it, it just felt good. It made sense um, all the way around. And, um, you know. Why did you leave after your sophomore year, though? I know things were a little bit tumultuous there. Uh, some of the, uh, the infractions came up, but uh, why leave after your sophomore season then? Well, because that's, well, Bob Wade was gone. Um, Gary Williams was the coach now. Um, things had changed. John, John Slaughter had left as a chancellor. Um, we were being unfairly penalized as players, uh, you know, and we weren't going to accept that. So the reason, one reason why I went there was my family could either attend the game or watch me on television. So the majority of my family is in North Carolina, still in Columbus County. So we were not allowed to be on television for my last two seasons. We were not allowed to participate in any NCAA or postseason tournaments, nothing at all. Um, you know, and so that's not what I signed up for to go to college. Um, and so, you know, it, I just felt it was unjust. And I had competed against the best players in the ACC. Um, I had averaged 20 points in the ACC. 
uh, my sophomore year. So I was just as competitive as anybody else that played my position. And when you look at all that, if they can make it, why not? Why not I? Mm-hmm. So, so that's the reason. I, I that wasn't my intent, but you know, when that hand is dealt to you, then you look at it and you make the the best choice. Go back a second. You said you thought it was unjust. Did you think that the penalty was unjust for what the infractions were? The whole entire thing was a charade. Uh, I just I knew that um, they wanted to get rid of Coach Wade. Um, they didn't want him hired in the first place, um, meaning uh, 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 Dr. Gurney, um, uh, Lou Perkins, athletic directors. Um, they wanted Gary Williams in the beginning. Uh, so the alumni had a big part of it. They did not want a high school coach from ball, inner city Baltimore representing them in the ACC at that time. Mm-hmm. And so uh, throughout the time I was there, um, they had tried their best to find any infraction on Coach Wade. Coach Wade's main infraction was um, to them, he helped Rudy Archer, which was an inner, inner city Baltimore kid, go to a community college. Yeah, gave helped him rides him. or had had the assistants give him rides to, him to, the, ride yeah. to another school to help get him out of the inner city. That's what Coach Wade had promised Rudy's mother that he would do. He would take care of him. Um, and Rudy had some uh, academic troubles in Maryland. Obviously, you come from an inner city. You now, you all of a sudden, you're in a major university. He didn't have the support system that he needed. Um, academic shortcomings came up, um, and so Coach Wade helped provide him a ride there. So uh, to a community college, they do that all the time now. I mean, it, it's amazing that they found that. And afterwards, Coach Wade lied about that, and so that's what happened. So I know that. Uh, you know, that was a trumped up charge, um, you know, and so no, that was charade the whole time. And I watched it play out. When you were drafted in the first round by the Knicks, number 17 overall, take me back to that night, getting the phone call. Were you expecting to go that high in the first round? Uh, yeah, I mean, they told me they would. Uh, they were drafted. Oh, really? Um, I, yeah, I, I went to New York and I worked out for them. And, um, you know, they told me they would draft me uh, if, if I was still available when, that, when my number came. Um, you know, so I, I wasn't really deeply concerned about it. I didn't know a lot about the draft, to be honest. Um, didn't know much at all. Um, so, you know, I, obviously I think I was happy when it happened. Um, and, um, yeah, I was just excited, I guess. What was it like for a young man from southeastern North Carolina to all of a sudden be in the biggest city in the world, getting paid a, a pretty good bit of money? And let's face it, in the media spotlight, the number one draft pick for one of the high-profile franchises. Um, it was different. It was a learning curve for me. Um, I had to go up there by myself and figure out the landscape, figure out the you know the travel routes from. Uh, Westchester County down to New York City to Manhattan. Um, got lost a lot. Uh, didn't know much about the NBA. Didn't know much about um, professional basketball because I was a college basketball guy. Um, so it was a steep learning curve for me, you know. But um, yeah, I mean it was a steep learning curve, but uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed my time in New York City. And you went to Phoenix. Uh, in a trade for Xavier McDaniel, obviously, uh, you know, another high profile franchise, but still, I imagine not the same kind of pressure you felt in New York City. Yeah. Uh, Phoenix was a different, a different place. Very, very different in New York City. Yeah. Um, night and day. Um, so an example in, in New York City, we wore suits to the games. We, we dressed up, we had a tailor, make suits. Um, you know, my when I first got to Phoenix, it was 105 degrees um, in October. Ooh. 105. Wow. So, uh, in the first game, I wore a suit. My teammates said, no, nah, we don't wear suits here. You can wear shorts and a, you know, shorts and a, a T-shirt. So, <laughs> that to me was like, wow, 
it's, it's a big difference, big change. So, uh, you know, and, and I think that, you know, when you look at Phoenix for what it is uh, or what it was at that point, there was a big debate in 92. Um, I got there in 91. Mm -hmm. um, they just passed the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday in 92. So all over the news, there was a debate about that. And, you know, so it, it, it was just a, I spent a lot of time in Harlem when I was in, you know, New York. And then to leave Harlem and to go to that, that was a drastic change for me. Um, so it had to kind of grow me a little bit so I can understand a little bit more. And it took me a while to, you know, to understand the landscape of Phoenix. And you went to the NBA Finals the next year uh, against Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and the Bulls. Was there any of the star effect there, or were you there just to do a job and you're playing and you're just as good as the guys in the other uniforms? Uh, see, I when, when New York, I played them four times. Doing a, I, no, I actually played them, I think, seven times total. Right. Uh, because we played them during this regular season then, and then playoffs. So I played Michael Jordan seven times already as a rookie, so I was pretty much familiar with them. I knew that you couldn't stop them, you know, so we knew that anyway. Uh, so it wasn't a star power. I think the thing was it was the playoff atmosphere, the energy, just everything goes into the playoffs. Uh, it's completely different than the regular season. Um, you know, the fan support that the Suns had was unbelievable um, throughout that run. You couldn't go anywhere and think about fans stopping you, wanting a picture or autograph or having signs. And so that was a that, that, that was a huge, you know, thing for us, you know, to witness and be a part of. You went overseas and won championships in Spain and in Poland as well. What's the biggest difference, Gerard, for those of us who may see international basketball once every four years during the Olympics, but you went over there and played. What's the difference in, number one, the game, and number two, how the players are looked at in cities in those uh, international leagues? Uh, I think the game um, is probably better basketball, quality basketball. Um, in terms of complete basketball players are developed in Europe. Um, they have a different way of developing talent. You see that in, in Luca, and you know, you see that in um, uh, the MVP this year, you see that in so many players and you wonder what, what happened. Well, they go through a, 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 a radical process that everyone does the same type of training. So I was able to see that. Um, when if you have talent and you're 12 years old and you play um and, and and you play for a team and um and you might be on our team for next eight years eight to 12 years unless you get a buyout for the nba um and they call them club teams you play for um the game is slower slower paced um it's methodical it's yeah, it, it, and and to me, it, it it related more to what I learned in high school. It, it did. It related more to high school and college. NBA is is an entertainment league too, so a lot of entertainment, right? Not as much as that in in the European basketball. So when you look at the Olympics, you wonder how could a team with all of the best players in the NBA only win by four or five points? you know, to Australia, to Spain, you know, or uh, Serbia. Well, that's what happens. It's a different style of basketball. Were you a better player overseas than you were in the NBA, do you think? Yeah, I got older um, and the game slowed down. So I think that um, one of my best coaches that I've had ever was a coach by the name Aito. He's one of the Spanish legend um, for Barcelona. And, um, I didn't think so earlier, but by the time we got to the championship round, I said, wow, he allowed me to see the game, not as an individual, more or less as a team, right? At, at, at how do you get the most out of your teammates, bring them up? And then 
allow you to expand your game as an individual during the right moments, during the championship rounds. So uh, I, I just watch how he helped develop me. And um, yeah, I, I grew a lot more as a player there. Um, the training is different. You know, you train differently. So the first month of the season, you don't touch a basketball. I've never seen that happen before. You really? run, you go to the to the mountains, you stay in uh, cabins or you stay in like dormitories and you will do running every single day. You run. No basketball shoes, no basketballs. And one thing they said it, it develops is not just, you know, getting you in shape, but team bonding. And I didn't understand that then. Everything's about team bonding, and it's about the team. Um, it's about being a part of a, 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 a of a brotherhood. Is is working for a common goal. And once you leave that training camp, now you go down and start playing basketball. So everything they do, I think, is is different, and it has a purpose. And um, their season is a lot longer than ours. And the ultimate goal is trying to find a way you know, to compete and win a, a championship. But that whole team bonding experience um, is what's different. Um, there's nothing wrong with what the NBA does. I mean, they model is the best. But um, there's not a lot of me and I in international basketball. Everything's about the team. Um, and so uh, that's it. And, and they don't market. You're not marketed as an individual over there. As, as you are here. Um, so that's a big difference, too. You retired in 2001. Was there a day or was there something that happened that Gerard said, OK, all right, this part of my life is now getting hung up in the closet and I'm going to go on with B, C, D and E. What happened to spark you to make that decision? Um, I'd always had this thought I wanted to retire at 30. I just always thought that I said maybe 10 years, but retire at 30. Um, and at my 31st birthday, before I turned 31, I wanted to step away. Um, I think my son was six, seven, and I wanted to start um, coaching him. On, when you are when you in Europe, you might spend – seven months if you're good you might spend nine or ten months um out the country and so you're missing all those years and um it, it get to a point where i think it wears on you and you just want to spend some more time um you know with family and, and back home um and so i was thinking of different things that I, I knew what i wanted to do but i just said you know what i think now the time to go ahead and do something different um, to really jump into what I want is my career. And, you know, I just decided to stop. Now, you, I probably stopped prematurely, but I decided to stop. You didn't wait until you gave up basketball to start other businesses. You, you formed, I believe you formed your first company when you were just out of college or pretty right. new to the NBA. So you started planning for life after the NBA while you were in the NBA, right? Correct. Yeah, I mean, I did that too, but I wanted to go on it, you know, full time. Um, I wanted to combine sports and community involvement, and community engagement. Um, I knew I wanted to work with young people. Um, and I, I knew that I wanted to, and I knew that I'll probably work in basketball my entire life because no matter what I do, where I go, when you're 6'10", basketball comes up, right? Yeah. No matter where. Yeah. So you can't escape it. And I, I have a lot to offer to the game and, and, the, and, the, and the people. So I wanted to have something that I could be useful in, uh, a, a basketball platform for that. Um, you know, and so I just just put your head together, start thinking about things and how and what and and and, and planning and now executing. And that's pretty much what I did. We hear oftentimes a lot of stories about these young men who come out of college and maybe don't have a lot of guidance and misspend their money. And five years in, they have nothing. Uh, whereas you started planning early on to do things 
when you were going to be done basketball. Did that create any kind of tension with anybody that you shouldn't be paying attention to that? You should be doing basketball 24-7, 365? Oh, yeah, all the time. I, I was the first thing the coaches told me. I, the very first thing they said, they said, well, you got too many, you, you have too many other things, interest other than basketball. Really? And, well, yeah, every single coach after high school would say that. Well, let me say Bob Wade did, but every single coach, other coach always said that. And Coach Aito didn't either. But uh, my professional coaches, yes, they thought I did. Uh, and, and they wanted you to just to work on becoming the best player you could become um, to get rid of anything else. And so you've seen some players in the NBA who come into the league and they start doing endorsements and businesses and other things. And if you pay attention, you'll see people say, ah, he probably shouldn't do commercial. He probably shouldn't do this. He sh they want to keep you focused on your sport. Now, for some guys that work, other guys, it, it doesn't. You know, you don't want to stunt your growth. And, you know, and sometimes you want to leverage um, as much as you can while you're still playing. Um, you know, and then, you know, we, we know that the, the shelf life for professional athletes right. is, is pretty short. Um, you know, and so you have to, to get involved in other things. You know, it, and the earlier you do it, the better it's going to be for you long term. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I see some players. I, I don't know. I a guy that retired. I know a guy that retired uh, two years ago. He was 39. Um, international basketball. Well, now he come home and figure out. Well, what am I going to do now? Yeah. He don't have a clue because he spent all this time, and he would play pretty much year round. He would go to Central America. Um, he would play in a lot of the lesser leagues, but he would still play professional basketball. Um, not making a lot of money, but he would still be a professional athlete. So now at, at 40 years old, he got to figure out, well, where do I start as an apprentice? You know, where do I start as a, as a, as a novice? And, and it's a hard learning curve for him because he don't have any experience. And so you don't want to be that player. Now, if you were someone that made 60 million, 70 million, doesn't matter what yeah. you do, you know. So, so, so it all depends. But those are the those are the 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 ultimate. Outliers, Most of the right. players yeah. are yeah. were in and are in where you yeah. are having to work hard, having to plan for that day when the basketball's in the corner and the rest of my life is ahead. That's right. Absolutely right. I've read a lot of stories, Gerard, and different things that you would tell stories about gambling in the back of the plane, about going out at night and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to regale us with all those, but is there a story about playing in the NBA that just kind of capsulizes what that life is like, having more money than you ever had before, being in the spotlight, spending on things you may have never spent on before? What's a story that you could tell us that kind of capsulizes either your life or another person's life in the NBA? Um. I mean, that's a hard question, but I will say this. So the, the, the gambling thing is, is, and everyone knows about the gambling thing. Um, and I had teammates that we would get on a flight. It could be an hour flight. And the most I've seen a guy have to pay is 13000 by by the time he, the plane, you know, uh, stopped. Lost $13,000 in one flight in an hour? Oh, an hour. Yeah, quick. Just wow. like that. Or I've seen players. Name, namely Charles Barkley, lose twenty thousand in a shooting contest with like a few a few three pointers in practice. Wow, uh, you know, so so uh, is it a gambling or is it just being competitive? I don't know. Yeah, um, but I think that we are competitive by nature, at least athletes are, um, and when you have disposable income. That just adds to it. It just makes it exciting, right? Yeah. Um, you you read about Michael Jordan and other players losing cars, losing you know high end vehicles um, by a simple gamble. You never you know? lost. You never lost a car, did you? No, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think I probably got into a game and lost 
twenty dollars my first time ever, and no, that was I enough. Just, I could watch. No, 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 no. I, I not at all. So, uh, and those guys are serious about their money too. So you know to pay up. So it's not like you can't. <laughs> <laughs> you can't no, say I'll, I'll write you a check when you land the plane. No, that doesn't Remember, work. I does played it? with Charles Oakley, so no, you. And, and he won most of the time, so you gonna pay him. <laughs> Who are you close to from those playing days now that you could call up and just say, "Hey, how are you? You having a good weekend? Do you have any close close friends?" Um, quite a few. Probably, you know, one is Mark West. Uh, the sons. Uh. Uh, Cedric Sabalos from the Suns, uh, uh, Charles Oakley, um, and lately it's been Patrick Ewing uh, because he's recruiting my son. Oh, nice. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, quite a few players. Most of your life has featured uh, accomplishments, and you've made a lot of positive out of things that have happened to you, but you had an instance where a young lady – who was carrying your child was murdered. And I'm, I, I don't want to dwell on this, but I have to ask you, during the trial, both sides brought you up. And how did you get through that, Gerard? Because you were, you were brought up in that, you were prominently named, never charged, another man is in prison. But how difficult was that for you to get through? Was that the darkest time in your life? Um, well, first thing, I think that uh, I don't believe anybody was carrying my child. So that's probably the first thing. Um, I, I read that somewhere. Okay. But that was never verified. Okay. So that was, that was the first thing. Okay. Um, I mean, that's that was a dark time, um, I must admit. Uh, anytime that someone brings up that type of allegation against you, I think it's it, it's it's a difficult thing, you know, you know to deal with particularly when you've done so many good things and, you know, that's completely against everything that you've done in your life. Uh, and I, I just couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't figure out why, um, why and where that came from. Um, and I was in a position where I couldn't do much about it. And that's a hard thing. You know, there's a, there's a trial going on and it's, you're limited to what you can do. You can't speak but so much on it. Um, and you can't really you, you can't really offer a, a, a public defense. Um, you know, and so so that's probably the the hard thing about that. It had to it had to be terribly difficult being the fact that, you know, uh, I guess your cousin is is the man who is uh, in prison now. If I remember if I'm wrong, please correct me. But, you know, I don't know what it would be like to be just accused of all of this. And then in your, you keep saying that you never had anything to do with it. And that had to be just a difficult, difficult time. Yeah, but when you put it in perspective, you understand, you know, the, uh, I guess, the terrain. You understand that uh, the things that I dealt with in Phoenix in terms of the atmosphere that was created, um, I was going through a, a, a dispute with the team. There were a lot of other variables that I think that wasn't, everyone didn't put together. Um, you know, that caused me to be uh, not in the best graces with the, with the Phoenix Suns at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so when, when, when those things happen, a lot of things, you know, you said find ways to, find ways to, uh, if they can salt your name, uh, then I think that that's one of the things that happened. And um, you think they yeah, were making I, you a scapegoat? Just it's easy. It's easy you know, to let's blame Gerard. Well, when you when you look at the, when you look at uh, the the timeline and that particular week, um, what was going on that week with me and the sons? Um, because I was on paper every single day. Um, we had come to a the sons and I had come to a. Uh, ahead uh, me and the general manager me and the team owner um we didn't see eye to eye so when all those things happen and then the following week you see an accusation and then the sons are being and there was a and and, and, and if you did your research um 
there was a court case regarding how was the sons getting privileged information um, with the authorities, with the investigation. They were working together is mm -hmm. somewhat, uh, you know, that, that makes me, you know, look at things a little bit differently. Right. So I, so I, so I saw that and, um, you know, I didn't think it was, it was just, I think it was fair. Um, you know, but again, not much you can do with that. You just mm -hmm. got to accept it. And, um, you know, I keep living my life and keep, you know, doing the work that I've been doing, um, throughout that. And hopefully people who, know me who knew me um believe in me can see that they can see through it you know and, and, and see that so so that was always the hope and um you know uh you know my family and friends supported me and um that's the most important thing what's the best piece of advice any coach ever gave you gerard um probably to be true to yourself in terms of you are who you are as a basketball player, um, not to try to be someone else. So a lot of times players look at another player and they try to be that player. So coach said, no, you are who you are. If you are a scorer, then you'd be a scorer. If you are a rebounder and a defender, then you'd be that. Uh, that's what you gotta be. Who was that um, coach? Uh, that coach was uh, Aito, Coach Aito in, in Spain. Former NBA first round draft pick Gerard Mustaf coming back with his basketball camp at Thomas Academy. It runs from June 13th through the 17th and it's free. Gerard, if any young man is out there right now in Southeastern North Carolina and wants to attend your camp, how can he uh, sign up to be at uh, Thomas Academy on that week? Well, go to well, our website is useliteBasketball.com and just complete the form and you're in, you in the camp. So it's www.useliteBasketball.com. They can also, uh, if they attend Thomas Academy or if they're, uh, uh, they can you know, contact Mr. John Crawley, uh, the basketball coach. Um, uh, at Thomas Academy uh, directly, and he can put add them to a list. So those are the two ways that they could, you know, any kid want to participate in the camp can come. Gerard Mustaf, I appreciate you taking the time today, coming back to Southeastern North Carolina, where you were born, where you spent your earliest years. Thanks for joining us on the One on One podcast. Thank you, John. I appreciate your time today. Look forward to meeting you one day soon. A big thank you to Gerard Mustaf for taking some time from his busy schedule and joining us for this episode. You can learn more about his basketball camps. Go to useliteBasketball.com. And to learn more about all of the programs that Gerard is involved in, go to his website, GerardMustaf.com. Now, before we go, I'd like to ask you a favor. Please download and subscribe to the One-on-One -on -one with John Evans podcast on whatever app you use to listen to your favorite shows. And if you would be so kind, please leave us a rating or a review. We'd love to get feedback from friends like you. And the more we get, the higher we'll be listed on the apps, the better chance we'll have of bringing in even more new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of One on One.